Praise God. I have been looking forward to this day for a while. And I'll tell you why. A few years ago, this was before COVID, uh, we had uh, we hosted a men's conference for the entire state uh, of our family of churches. We hosted it over at our East Campus. And usually they bring in some big name, you know, to be the, the keynote speaker. I don't know if it was a football player or Frank Shamrock, or, you know, the MMA fighter. I don't know who it was that, that year. But I can't remember. Because the only person, the only speaker that I remember from that year is the man you're about to hear from today. It's the first time I'd ever heard of this guy. First time I'd ever seen him. He was a young guy. He was a, a campus pastor uh, at one of our churches in the Charleston area. And I was like, huh, how'd he get this gig? Who's this guy? Five minutes later, after he started, I knew why. <laughs> because Brother Tyler still has a word from God. I mean, the word of God is in his mouth, and it is sharp as a two-edged sword. And I'm telling you, I, I was challenged. I was called up that day. And that's a day I'll never forget. And from that day on, I was like, this guy has to come preach here at Trinity at some point. I wasn't even the lead pastor at that point. <laughs> God put it in my heart on that day. This was years ago by now. But I, I'm excited to, to, give, to present to you this, a man of God who is following the leading of the Lord. He's, I'm sure he's going to tell you a lot more about it, and I'm not going to steal his thunder. But he's, he's planting a church in Spartanburg, South Carolina, called Story Church. Because someone needs your story. So we talk about sharing our story here at Trinity. So that is a natural uh, natural piece of common ground for us in our messaging and in our calling as churches. So would you just uh, welcome to the stage Pastor Tyler Still to bring the word of God today. Well, good morning. It's so uh, so awesome to be here. It, I've looked forward also to uh, connecting. Um, years ago, I, I got got to do that. It's funny. It was uh, Ken Shamrock was the. It was a wrestler, and uh, I just remember wanting to be really nice to him um, because he he took a lot of hits to the head, and he was okay with it. Um, so I, uh, I I remember that day. It was so cool, and uh, I think they called me in because somebody canceled, and they were like, "Hey, we just need someone to preach," and I was like, "Well, I will preach." But um, hey, I, I send greetings from uh, now Spartanburg, South Carolina. Um, and uh, my family is, we have been traveling over the last uh, 54 weeks. I have been traveling um, to share our story and what God's called us to do and raising support and um, telling uh, our uh, Assemblies of God churches all about what God's doing. And uh, it's been great, but we have a um, two kids. I don't know if we have the uh, family photo there, uh, but, uh, but uh, I have two kids and they are worn out from traveling. And so we have done once a month now they travel with me. And uh, the rest of the time, they've found a home church in, um, in our hometown until we can get our church started, and uh, they deserve that. But uh, I have a seven-year-old son. Um, his name is Lyric. Uh, yes, like song lyrics. No, we are not musical. Um, but uh, but uh, God spoke to my wife early in her life. She was told she couldn't have children. And so she told the Lord her entire life, Lord, if you ever give me a son, I'll ensure that he's a worshiper. And uh, also, cool connection, I was led to the Lord through a song. Um, someone sent me a song in the midst of me battling um, a really kind of dark time in my life. I'll share a little bit about today. And uh, so it was the lyrics of a song. I read them, and I got on my floor and began to pray my first ever prayer uh, and gave my heart to Jesus. And so we said, that's probably significant. And so his name is Lyric Andrew, which means song of man. It's worship back to God. And he is our miracle, and I'll share his story. He is chaos in a, in a human form. Um, he is absolutely crazy. Um, but he is a joy. And then our miracle baby um, coming now. We have a one-year-old. And so you can see the gap of uh, that gap represents turmoil, trial, and loss for us. And uh, we have Liam, and his name is Liam Asher, which means fought for blessing. And he is uh, golden. He loves his mom more than anything. And how many mamas know you need a little boy that loves you, not just their daddy, right? Come on. It is uh, 
it's a big deal. And so they send their, their love to you. Lyric um, wanted me uh, to know that, or you to know that he thinks that it's really good I'm preaching here uh, because Columbia more than anywhere needs Jesus because it has the Gamecocks and we are Clemson fans. So <laughs> that's a terrible way to lose people right there, right? You're like, all right, let's go, let's go. We're getting out of here. But he said, dad, that's good. Gamecocks need Jesus. And I said, that is true, son. That is true. <laughs> Hey, uh, just before I start, I just felt um, prompted to kind of tell you, um, Pastor Jay mentioned that you guys were going to be canvassing neighborhoods and sharing invites and things like that. And a lot of times as church people, we can be like, how fruitful are those things? And um, sometimes it can be overwhelming a little bit and a little bit awkward and all these different things. And I, I want to just kind of give you a testimony of God's goodness in that. Uh, I am standing here today not because I had a spiritual family not because I had spiritual grandparents that prayed for me. I'm standing here today because one teenager decided to canvas their school and hand out invites to a youth event, and they handed one to me, and I went because I was out of money. Uh, I spent all my money on uh, alcohol and drugs while my parents were in Mexico on a vacation, and I wanted a meal, and they said, I'll buy you lunch if you come to my church. And, uh, and so I came, heard the gospel, and I'm now following Jesus because of a canvas invitation uh, given. So do not undermine uh, handing out a piece of paper. It, it works. But today I, I want to jump in um, and just kind of honor your leadership by, by telling you uh, really what I'm here to do today. Uh, my goal and my heart today is not to have uh, one second where you're impressed by the words that I can come up with, um, not for one second that I would um, say something that would just inspire you, um, not that I would just encourage you and make you feel better about where you're at or where you're going. My goal here today is to call you back to something that is desperately needed in every human life, and that is back to a trust, absolute trust, that God's ways are better than yours, that God's plans are better than your plans, that God's able to redeem what has been lost, and God is able to direct a future for you that is not just good for you, but it's actually exactly why you were created. And I really believe that the greatest place you can be in life is not a strategic place. It's not that you would have done better in your early years so that you can get it right. The greatest place that you can be in life is really simple. It is where God asks you to be. It's to do what God asks you to do. To not ask questions of him. It's not to create your own plans and purposes. It's to do what Jesus has asked you to do. That's the goal of life. Success in life is not a marker. It is not a place. It is not a house. It is not a job. Success in life is to be exactly where God's called you to be. And today I want to I prompt you towards that in a message that I've simply titled, Follow the Nets. If you have a Bible, you can turn to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5 will be in verses 1 through 11. I want to read it with you today because um, in this passage there is a challenge. Uh, many of you, if you've been in church any amount of time, you've heard this passage. But I, I want to preach to you a little differently. I want to talk less about the people you can reach and talk more about the, the way that you're supposed to live your life according to what God asks. And so if you'll read it with me, it's in Luke chapter 5. You can follow along um, on the screen. I'm reading in the NIV because it's the only Bible that's not in storage, okay? So that's a, and it's nearly inspired version. And so that is a, kidding. It says this, it says, one day as Jesus was standing by the lake Gennesaret, the people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. And he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon. He asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, just like all of us would, Master, uh, I don't know if you've been paying attention, but we've worked hard all night. And we've caught nothing. Isn't that the worst fishing trip? When you're just casting, you're not fishing, you're just casting. And then he, he says this. He says, but, but because you say so. If you're taking notes or highlighting in your Bible today, that would be the statement I would wrestle with the rest of today is, Lord, but because you say so, I'll let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boats to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I, I'm a sinful man. Uh, that's a biblical way of saying I'm not worthy to be in the presence of someone so powerful. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken, and so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, and Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, 
don't be afraid. For now on, you'll fish for people. And here's the final part that I really want to land on today. So they pulled their boats on the shore. They left everything, and they followed him. Would you pray with me, thanking God for his word? Father, thank you so much. There was a part of your plan from the beginning of time that would you, you would not leave us to aimlessly hope that we could find you, but rather you would write, you would pen through people and the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you would pen words that we might see your character, your nature, your love for us, and your desire for our lives. And God, I pray that we as people who have such access to it would not take it lightly that today we have the inspired, true word of God to speak to our hearts. And Lord, I pray that as I preach, as you've called me to do, God, that the words of my mouth would fall very silent compared to the words of your Holy Spirit. Speak to our hearts, we pray, that we might be more like you, that we might follow you. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, this uh, passage is referred to as the calling of the disciples. There's absolutely so much in this passage that I, I'm telling you, you could do a, a sermon series for eight weeks and not cover all of this passage. There's so much happening that, to the, the glory of God and, and, and uh, the desire of the people for the word of God in that time. And Jesus kind of taking ownership of something that doesn't seem to be his and everyone just kind of being okay with it. I, I don't know if you noticed that, but it's, it's almost like he went to the boat ramp and he was like, hey, go ahead and put that boat back in the water. It's mine today. And, and they just kind of do it. There's so much here. But today, I, I think the, the crucial part of this is there's a journey that seems to happen with nets that kind of reflects the hearts of the people he's ministering to. We see that the nets begin very simply with with something simple, they're, they're washing nets, they're tending to their nets, and then these nets are placed back into the boat, and, and the boat is set back out to sea, and, and then these nets are thrown in the water again, even though it, they had just done it unsuccessfully. Now they're throwing the nets again, and then these nets begin to get full, and then the nets begin to break, they're so full. And then we find the nets left in a boat. This progression of these nets, I think, tells a story of the human heart. And today I want to unpack that with you to challenge you towards one simple idea and statement today. There's a lot of talk about what we can do to have a better life. There's a lot of talk about what could happen and what could be good and what I could do and what you could do. But here's the truth. Here's the one statement I really want you to grab today. To live the life Jesus truly has for you requires letting him lead. Let me speak to American Christians for a moment. This is probably our biggest challenge in Christianity, is we're down with Jesus being in charge until he actually takes charge. I, I, you're in charge. you got to get me out of this situation. And then we get our feet on the ground, and we take back control. How many of you maybe just be willing just a little bit to admit you're a little bit of a control freak like me, like you need everything to go a certain way? My, my wife tells me it's a real challenge in my life. I think it's a real gift, but, um, but we, uh, we differ on opinion there. But I, I love things to go a certain way. I, I like to plan things out. In fact, today, my day today is so planned out minute by minute by minute because when I leave today, I have an hour and 30-minute drive back to an event, and the setup is going to take exactly an hour and 20 minutes, and then we're going to throw an event in our community, and it's going to last exactly an hour and 10 minutes, and, and then after that, we're going uh, to huddle up, and for 20 minutes, we're going to praise God for what he did all day, and, and I have it all mapped out down to when I, my feet leave the floor and hit the bed. And so often in my life, I have to understand, to live in the kingdom of God is to forfeit your plans. It's to say, God, my plans are not in charge. Yours are. To live the life Jesus has for you requires letting him lead. So what does this look like? Today, I want to show you through this journey of the nets what allowing Jesus to lead your life truly looks like. The first is this, if you're taking notes, the first point today is this, is is this requires releasing control of our lives completely to God. Completely releasing. This, this sense of opening your hands and saying, God, I'm not in charge. It's, it's the sense of, it's Carrie Underwood singing to you, Jesus, take the wheel, right? Come on, we love that song. But it, it's saying, I, I, I'm not in charge. It says that they were washing their nets. And Jesus summons Simon. He says, hey, 
I know you're over here toiling and you're doing your thing and you've been unsuccessful and you've tried very hard, but, but I want you to put out into the water again. I want you to let down the nets again. Can you imagine how frustrating that must have been? I want you to imagine working a night shift. Some of you in the room that work night shifts, maybe you're a, a nurse in a hospital or, or you work at a mill or something like that, but you got the late night shift and you get done and, and this, this boss of yours has the the courage to walk up to you and be like, hey, let's, let's go ahead and work another 12. I put it in context here because I, I think sometimes we read these stories and we're like, yeah, I would have totally done it. It's Jesus. No, you wouldn't have. You would have complained. You would have asked, where's the coffee? Am I getting overtime? Is it double pay and a half or what? Like, how are we doing this again? It's so easy to take all emotion out of the stories of the Bible and forget that this call was absolutely frustrating. He says, I want you to throw it down. I need you to know that the context of this passage, this wasn't the first time that these disciples would have known of Jesus or heard of Jesus. They had seen his works. One of them had experienced the power of God already in his own life, but, but they hadn't yet submitted themselves completely to, to Christ and, and his working and doing. And, and so they're sitting there and they know he's powerful. They know what he can do. They, they know what could be. They know he's done crazier things than fishing. But they have to be wondering, is this guy just wanting to learn our trade? Or is he actually going to do it? They didn't have a promise of a miracle. They didn't have a promise that God would come through for them. But, but they had this, this ploy, this question. Will you throw the nets again? Second dynamic that must be understood is they hadn't yet fully submitted, but there's a sense of the authority of God in their life because you see that they say, Master, they acknowledge his power and his goodness. They acknowledge what he's able to do and what he could do, and they say, Master, and because he was Master, their, their only thing they can follow, when you call someone Master, the only rightful thing to say is because you say so. Lord, because you say so. One of the great mistakes of modern Christianity today is that we acknowledge Jesus as Savior, but not as Lord. Let me say that again. We love Jesus who saves me, but we tend to forget that Jesus also gets to lead me. If he's Savior of my life, he's Lord of my life. The day he saves me is the day I forfeit control of everything I have to him. It's to say, Jesus in modern Christianity, it's Jesus. I love the Jesus that's warm and cuddly and accepts me for who I am. And can I tell you, he does. But from that moment on, you don't get to live the same. One of my favorite contexts of, of what Jesus does in people's lives often is, is you'll notice he'll, he'll free them of a situation of judgment and of people and, and pointed fingers. But then what does he say every single time? Now go and sin no more. Now go live differently. I'm here to save you from what you're in, but you can't run right back to it and expect me, expect me just to be okay with it. And a lot of times what we do is we love Jesus to pick us out of the mud so we can jump right back in it. Let me, let me try this again on my own. We have to give God control. Here's, what, here's something. When, when we take control, we leave no room for God to be God. Every single time that we take control of our lives, here's what we're saying back to God with our lives. I'm better at being God than you are. That's a tough one, right? What does this look like practically to release, or another way to say it could be surrender to God? Listen, surrender is not just an emotional choice or something we do during worship. Surrender in action looks like obedience. Surrender is to say, hands up, you're in charge. And the only proper way to surrender is to say, God, you get to tell me what to do. Now, we can make judgments against God's character on this and say, God, you know, I don't like the way you would do these things. And I would do this if I was God. And I would do that if I were you. But we have to remember that God's ways are higher than our ways. And his perspective is greater than us. And he's not trapped in time and sees things like we do where we're hoping things go well. Or he sees all of it. He sees the big picture. And he actually cares more about who we become than where we go. God will often let us walk through the valleys of life so that we can handle the pinnacles. But we would skip it. We just want good. We want to feel good. God wants us to be good. There's a big difference. 
Surrender means to stop fighting, to stop pushing against. It says, hey, it, it actually, I love one definition. It was written this way. It says it's to take your weapons, your plans, and anything else you have and place them at the feet of someone else and say, I'm at your disposal. It's to surrender and say, God, you get to tell me what to do. How many parents we have in the room? You'll understand this on a different level, okay? I love being a parent. Um, I I never thought uh, the way my life was headed, I didn't know if I'd ever get to be a parent. And and I, I just think it's the coolest thing. And as I told you guys, my seven-year-old son, Lyric, is he's absolutely the coolest kid ever. I, I, I love him. I tell him all the time, I'm like, you're, as a kid, who I thought I was. I wish I was as cool as you were. Like, he's just, he's fun. Uh, we were in Clemson last night watching a baseball game, and he was just the the star of the crowd. He was dancing. He was going crazy so much so a grandma behind us gave me five bucks because she thought he was cute. Like, I, I was like, that never happened for me. It, it never. He's missing teeth in the front. Like, there's no way he's that cute. But, but my son loves everything. He is a stereotypical southern boy. For some reason, we didn't have to introduce it or anything. He likes everything outside. And uh, I have video evidence of this, so I can share this um, confidently. At two years old, my son was riding a bike without training wheels. I have video evidence. Uh, we wanted training wheels on his bike, but he said that the big kids didn't have it, so he didn't have it. Like, a, a two-year-old little mind, he would look at big kids, and he'd look at his bike, and he would point those off. He couldn't even barely talk, but he could ride a bike. And so he would ride his bike everywhere. He always had skins, and he, he would run straight for ditches because he thought they were jumps. It was It was chaos, and... So because of that, we started sports, and um, at three, uh, almost four years old, we bought him his first little dirt bike, and, and so we started riding dirt bikes, and I know you're wondering about my parenting choices. It's okay. He's, he's still here with us so far, and so, but he loved it, and uh, so for his fourth birthday, we got him a, a little, um, uh, like, electric four-wheeler. It was a teeny little four-wheeler he could handle. It. Got him a helmet, got him goggles. Uh, the helmet was bigger than his torso, so it just looked funny, so it was fun for us, and his feet didn't touch the pegs. They just kind of waved in the wind as he rode, and, and one day, I, I took him out riding, and, and we found these trails, and we started going through, and we came to a pinnacle moment in a southern boy's life, and that is we ran into a, a mud puddle. And we stopped, and we looked at it, and he, he looked, and he looked at me, and I looked at him. And that's when I knew this was a moment of discipleship in the life of a young boy. I said, son, we're about to change your life. And he just looked at me with big eyes through those goggles. All I could see is eyes and little teeth smiling. And he, I said, son, you're going to trust me here. I said, son, you're going to take that four-wheeler, and you're going to go through that mud puddle. And he looked at me, and he just kind of shook his head no, like this is not happening. I was like, son, you're going to trust me. You're going you're gonna to go through that mud puddle. And so finally, with his little helmet on, he's standing up as best he can. He looks at me and he says, if you say so, and he takes off through the mud puddle. I, I've just got to be really honest with you guys. I completely underestimated the depth of the, the mud puddle. I just, it just, I, I missed it. It was a miss for me. I apologize. Um, and uh, so there's the little guys right there. So um, I completely did. And I, I'm not kidding, guys. He completely disappeared. He just, in my mind, my first thought, I wish it was save him, but the first thought is, is you know, just save me. And I was like, how am I going to explain to his mother that we no longer have a child because of a mud hole? Like, he, he just was a glob, gone. And all of a sudden, the coolest moment happened. That glob just kind of started moving towards me. Like, just this, it was like the mud was just moving towards me. And I could hear, like that. And can't make this up, y'all. All of a sudden, this glob comes out. I can't, he is not a human. It's just a glob of mud, and all I see is white teeth shining through. He's smiling the whole time, and he gets out of the other side of the mud puddle. He stands on top of his seat, and he says, let's go! It starts screaming. It was the craziest, coolest moment ever, and that's when I knew I was doing something right as a father. And I was like, this is, this is a moment. Now, you're not going to tell your mother what we just did. We're going to go find a water hose. Um, but he told his mom, um, but, <laughs> but I'll never forget in that moment, I learned a lesson about my father in heaven, and it was that my son at three, four years old had an understanding that I didn't have as an adult, and that was if my father says to do something, even if it looks challenging, if he says to do it, it can be trusted, because he understands at four years old that, you know what, my father cares for me, and he would not call me to do something that would harm me. Now, I, I'm a flawed father, so he could have been harmed, okay? But, but our Father in Heaven completely understands the complexities of our lives, 
He understands the wounds that you carry, the mistakes you've made. He understands every aspect of your, your life. And oftentimes when God says, hey, I want you to do this, we shake our fists back at God and say, God, how could you ask me to do that? If you loved me, you wouldn't ask me to do that. And what he's saying on the other side is, I, I wish you would trust me like a four-year-old trusts his father and just say, God, if you ask me to do it, I'll, I'll do it. God cares for you. Can I remind you, God doesn't just care for you enough to keep you from things. He cares for you enough to walk with you through things. He cares for you. It's my desire today to unlock this posture in your life that, that your Father in heaven can be trusted so much that life should be lived with one simple phrase. God, if you say so. You want me to do it again? If you say so. You want me to forgive them? If you say so. You, you want me to... You want me to take this big step of faith? If, if you say so, God, I'll do it. Listen, surrender is the path to all that God has for you. You'll never understand all that God set aside for you and has allotted for your life until you just surrender to what he has. I love one author, um, Levi Lusco, wrote a book, and he says it this way. He says, surrender is like a fish finding the current and going with it. It's stopping swimming against the current, but it's finally jumping in a current and allowing God to propel us into all that he has for us. But I want you to notice what he was really calling them to do. He says, I, I want you to launch out into the deep. Why, why the deep? Because if you're a fisherman, you know, if you stay close to shore, you might catch small fish. But in order to catch big fish, you have to go deeper. Why don't we like the deep? Because we can't see the bottom. We can't see what's below us. We have to trust that something's there. Something will work out. He's saying, I, I want you to go deeper for things that I have for you. Here's what he's saying. I, I want you to have ambition. I want you to take the ambition you have in the secular and make it spiritual. You might just have to receive this, but I, I want you to hear this. I, I'm blown away by the tenacity and, and ambition we have for things that aren't of God and the very little we put towards God. I, I, some of you are more committed in the gym than I could ever be. You, some of y'all wake up at 4 o'clock in the morning to go be sweaty, right? Like, it just, as you can tell, I don't, right? And so I, I'm trying. I, I, I started doing CrossFit lately because it's some dumb idea. Someone talked me into it. They're like, you should do it. It's crazy. And I walk in there, and people are just throwing their bodies everywhere, and they're like, it's awesome, right? I was like, I'd rather go to breakfast and talk about something. But, um, but it, it, it's bizarre to me that we, we have the motivation to wake up in the morning and give an hour and 30 minutes of our lives to sweating and becoming physically fit, but God doesn't get 10 minutes. It's wild the ambition we'll have in our careers that we'll work overtime and we'll, we'll forsake time with our family. We'll forsake plans that we have and travel and all the different things that we want to do. We don't have time for anything else and we'll go after these things so that we can achieve this position, but, but God rarely gets an extra moment. I'm not saying to not be ambitious in other things. I'm just wondering why has ambition in the American church never found its way into the spiritual? When's the last time we said, man, I, I want to be ambitious in my time with God? I want to be ambitious in my time in prayer. I want to be ambitious with my reading of the word. I, I want to be ambitious in faith. I want to take bigger steps of faith this year than I have ever taken. I want to be ambitious in, in giving. I want to give to the poor or give to the needy or, or support a great cause this year. What about ambition? What if you were as passionate about doing what God's asked you to do as you were working out or your career or your greatest hobby? I, I'm often convicted in this season of my life that I, sometimes I, I need to check my heart and go, am I as ambitious with my time with God as I am my hobby of golf? I, I've, I've caught the bug of golf. I love going and playing golf. I don't know why. You're miserable the entire time you play. It's so hard, but, but I just love being miserable out there. And I would literally, I, I can't, I'm not lying to you when I say this. I, I would do it every single day of my life if I could. And I wonder if I have that same ambition for the presence of God, for worshiping him. Why don't we go in the deep? It's, it's in the deep that we're faced with our fears, the unfamiliar Hear this, sometimes surrender looks like giving up trying to understand and finding comfort in not knowing. Isn't that a crazy, I met a Marine on a flight, I was traveling to Ohio to speak at a, 
an event, and um, I got sat next to this guy, and I'm normally the guy that hurries and puts headphones on because I do not love airplane talk. It's just always like, what do you do? Where are you from? How'd you get here? I'm like, I walked through the terminal. I got on the plane. <laughs> like, And then they find out I'm a pastor, and it's just over. It's like once you say you're a pastor, they're like, God bless you, buddy, and they want to know about, well, what does this mean? about? And I was just like, <sighs> but this time the guy asked me a question, and I asked him, and turns out he was actually escorting his one of his partners was up under the plane had just given his life in the war and he was taking his uh, body back to his family and so we got talking about that and it was a heavy conversation but he started talking about I started asking him he was special forces and there's 11 of him in the in the United States military and we start talking we're going through all these things and we're having a great talk we still text to this day and he said uh, he challenged me he was a believer he came to faith he um, grew up in in the system uh, never has known family and said the military is the only family he's ever known and he challenged me with one simple thought by the end of the conversation he said uh, he said I think faith is getting comfortable with living uncomfortable and he said the key to the military special forces is becoming comfortable with being uncomfortable and I think at some point in our lives we desire comfort so deeply that we forfeit what God has on our lives God will often take us to the unknown and the uncomfortable in order to show us he's actually with us Sometimes, do you ever find yourself being like, where's God? He's probably in the uncomfort you, for, you forbid yourself from going into. He's probably behind the door that you continue to keep shut because you're afraid of what will happen. How do we access this thing? I, I want to challenge you really simply. This is not going to revolutionize you guys, your thoughts, but I, I want to challenge you. How do we know what God's actually asking us to do? It's really simple. It starts with just praying. Remember, prayer is a two-way communication. It's not you telling God what you need. In fact, we should probably uh, sit in silence far more than we talk. Sometimes the greatest prayer sounds like this. Americans really struggle with that moment right there. You're like, all right, we get it, go. Saying, God, do it. Another way is, I love that Proverbs 3 tells us to, to look into the word and, and I'm asked as a, a, a line with his word. It says, acknowledge me in all your ways and I'll make your path straight. Or, or here's another crazy thing, and this is not just for young people. For some reason, we cut. there's a cutoff date on this, but seek out wise counsel. Even if you're in your 60s, seek out wise counsel. Who is in your life that you trust their heart for you enough to be able to speak into your life and say, this is what I want for you or this is what God has for you? It begins with releasing control of our lives to God. The second thing is this. We receive what God actually has for us. Here's something. This may seem um, very redundant, but I'll be honest with you. A lot of times when we actually find out what God has for us, <laughs> we refuse it. We're like, you want me to do Well, no, I don't have time for that. Or that's not how I drew it up. That word says, but because you say so, I'll let down the nets. And when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish, what their nets began to break. So they signal their partners. Can I tell you, this is one of the greatest miracles in all of Scripture, and we just pass over it because it's just fish. But I often read this and wonder a, a few things. i, I got to be honest. I wasn't raised in church. Um, I, I didn't go to church until I was uh, late in my teenage years. I, I didn't come up kind of believing everything in the Bible. In fact, uh, my wife picks on me all the time. When people used to wear crosses with Jesus on them, I never knew about the resurrection. So I was like, it's really weird that that guy died, and everyone wears him around their neck. That's crazy. And they're like, she told me that he resurrected, and I was just like, you're kidding me. What is going on? And I was 17 years old in the Bible Belt, and I had never heard of resurrection before. But but I, uh, I grew up not really um, believing in God or any sense of God or the scriptures or anything. And so when I came into reading the Bible, I have to be really honest. I, I read it through a perspective that's different than maybe some of you have done your whole life. But my wife, when she reads the Bible, she goes, this is the truth, and I just have to accept it no matter what. That's what she was trained her entire life. She was a deacon's kid. But for me, I'm like, I'll question it. Well, you gonna find out what's actually happening here. And so the first time I ever read this, I was like, they must have found a new honey hole. You know what I'm talking about, fishermen? Y'all know it? They went to a better spot. They wanted to impress Jesus. That's probably what happened. But the Bible actually makes clear that the, the location of their fishing it, it wasn't really the thing. In fact, the disciples give us a clue into what changed in this passage. It wasn't the place they went. It wasn't what they used. I often wonder what kind of bait they were using, you know? Like, it would be good to know for future reference what bait did Jesus use to catch this many fish. 
I started thinking about all these different things, but, but the Bible actually is very clear to us that only one thing gets celebrated as the significant change from catching no fish to catching more fish than they could handle. And that one significant change is one simple thing is that in the beginning at that night, the disciples went out by themselves to fish. And that morning, they went out, and Jesus was in their boat. They did the same insignificant actions. They did the same practices. They would have thrown the same nets out of the same boats in the same thing. But all of a sudden, that which is unfruitful becomes fruitful. And what does that tell us about our life? The most the, the most amazing place you can be, the most fruitful place you can be, is not the strategic place in your life, but it is the appointed place God has for you. It is where God has asked you to be. If you will go where God asks you to be, he'll be with you. His presence goes with you. He goes before you and stands behind you. He surrounds you. His armies of angels walk with us through every war we go through. The only difference and significant change in this passage of Scripture is that one time Jesus was with them and the other he wasn't. And some of you have been trying to do things for God. But God has not gone with you because it's not what he's asked you to do. And you're over here toiling, and you're wondering, why do I keep going through the same cycle over and over again? And here's the difference. At some point or another, we have to acknowledge, the only way this changes is if God goes with me. I can do the same thing with the same effort, with the same tenacity, but it does not change unless God is with us. At some point or another, we have to acknowledge that we simply have to do what God's asked us to do to receive, no matter how it feels. I don't know about you, but I've had seasons where it's hard to follow God. If we can acknowledge that in church. I know in church world we just act like, oh, God's good all the time, all the time God's good. And I'll be honest, he is good all the time, but that doesn't mean I always think that about him. There's some times in my life where I've looked and I'm going, God, really? Have you ever stepped out and been faithful to God and you go through the hardship again and you're like, God, I'm trying for you. You can't give a little to me. I know I've been there. 2020 was a year that no one will ever forget. It's the most bizarre year of human existence to me. It is. Can you think? Of, I mean, just think about it. It's like we've just breezed over. We passed through it. 2020 was insane. 2020 also changed my life in many ways. I drink way more coffee because of 2020. I cannot walk by a dispenser of hand sanitizer because of 2020 without getting some. I'm just constantly doing, like, I did that three times on the way back there. I was just like, why do you keep washing your hands? But also 2020 changed our life. Um, I shared a little bit about our family. We had Lyric. He's a, just an amazing kid, amazing boy. He, he wows us. And I, I don't have time to go into the details of it, but Lyric is a miracle after miracle kind of child. My wife was told, uh, our oldest right there, uh, my wife was told she couldn't have kids, and all of a sudden um, she started eating tons, and she wouldn't stop eating, and I kept having to go do, like, runs for ice cream at night, and I'm like, what is going on? My wife is just, she's losing it. She weighed, like, 90 pounds, so it was fine, so who cares? Like, she didn't worry about it, right? And so I was like, whatever, and finally, um, smarter people than us were like, have you ever considered that maybe something might be going on with her if she's continuing to be hungry and eating and all this? And we're like, no, no, she's just hungry, just adulthood. And all of a sudden, we kind of checked out, and we found out she was pregnant. And so they told her it was a huge risk to her life. My wife has a form of epilepsy. At eight years old, she started having seizures every single night of her life. And so every single night of my wife's life, she has between 20 to 30 seizures because her brain cannot go in and out of REM sleep. And so as you sleep a great sleep, she wakes up 30 times a night. Her entire life, since eight years old, every single morning, she takes 4,000 milligrams of uh, the medicine they give you to go to sleep. Uh, in the hospital. She takes it and has to function on it. And she suffered this way her entire life. And so they told her she was going to be an at-risk case and all these things. And uh, during the pregnancy of Lyric, we saw those things. My wife had two 11-minute uh, seizures that knocked her completely out. One time she had to learn who I was again and that I was her husband and that she was pregnant. And she had to re relearn how to walk one time and relearn how to use her hands. And all these different things were happening constantly. And we were just kind of like, what's going on? And and finally, Lyric um, enters the world, and so he's born, and it's the greatest day ever. And we started doing the things, you know, if you've had a baby, you know what happens. Uh, they just warn you. They're like, you're just never going to sleep. And I'm like, we've never slept. We're going to be amazing at this. Like, she wakes up 30 times a night. Add four more. Who cares, right? Like, it's not a big deal. And 
So we started noticing. We were doing a thing, and about a week and a half in, we start noticing. I'm like, honey, uh, how, how many times did you get up last night? She's like, well, four, he woke up four times. And I was like, so you got up four times? She's like, yeah. And I'm like, just four. She's like, yeah, I got up with, when the baby woke up. And we just stopped. And I can tell you, uh, medically, it's been proven. We've actually prayed with our doctor because the day that Lyric was born is the last day that my wife ever had a seizure. She's completely healed. And she's been healed of it completely. They have confirmed it. And uh, her doctor looked back and we were like, what do you think happened? And she goes, can I be honest? And I was like, yeah. She's like, aren't you a preacher? I was like, well, yeah, yeah, I'm a preacher, she said. I was like, oh. <laughs> My wife actually got to pray with her in our doctor's office to uh, begin her faith journey. It was an amazing thing, but we were so excited by this, and God healed, and it was amazing. And then we started going through this journey. We were like, you know what? We make such a cute kid. We should do it again. And so during 2020, we went through the craziest season. We went after miscarriage, after miscarriage, loss after loss. And I'll never forget um, – June 29th, I was building a patio on the back of our house. Let me just rephrase that. My father-in-law was building it, and I was handing him the hammer so that people would think I was a part of it. And um, and uh, we're building this thing, and my wife comes out. She's pregnant. We're excited and everything. And my wife comes out, and she's completely covered in blood. And So I rushed her to the hospital, and we lost our child. And because it was 2020, I couldn't even go through the process with her. She had to do it completely by herself, six hours of um, just chaos, and it hit us, and they let us know right then, we have a piece of paper that let us know that my wife was an unexplained, a 4% of all of human women, a 4% unexplained infertility, she would never parent again, and to be honest, if you're a woman in here, you'll understand this on a level that men just can't, and I can't even, but I, I lost a sense of my wife that day, joy was ripped from her, and so much identity things were challenged in her, and she's just broken, and we were, we were hurting. And to be honest, I was angry at God because I just was, I was, I had this statement. I said, Lord, I would have rather you just not given us the hope than give us hope and then rip our hearts out. Like I was, everything was going to get better and there we go again. We were heartbroken and I went on a run one night. As you can tell, it doesn't happen often. So it was a special night and we, I went running, and I just kind of had, you're going to be shocked by this, but as a preacher, I just kind of had one of those honest moments with God. And I started yelling at God while I was running, and if anyone was standing outside, I had earphones in, it probably sounded like a madman running down their road, but I just yelled at God, and I said, God, why don't you leave my family alone? Because every time you bring hope, you rip it out. Just leave us alone. We're fine without all of this. And I said, I'm not going to pray for this again. I'm not going to do any of this, and so I went home, and I was like, I told my wife, we're done with it. It's over. We're not trying. We're, we got one great kid. Let's raise this kid. We'll be done with all this stuff. And uh, that night, every single night, we do prayers with um, Lyric, and we pray together. And then mom leaves, and we have boy talk, and we talk about important, you know, men, discipleship things like cheer for the Tigers and the Braves and open the door for your mom. Um, don't ever ask a woman how old she is. Those kind of things, you know, like good things. And. We're having that conversation, and at the end of every single night, Lyric's a Pentecostal, so he wants to pray for all of his teddy bears. Every toy gets anointed and all those things. And so we've limited it. You get one request every single night. So I said, son, what do you want to pray for? And his response back to me shocked me. He said, uh, he said Dad, I want to pray for the baby that's coming. And I was, I'm going to be honest, like, it's a cute moment, right? Not for me. Because I'm like, now you're going to break my son's heart. And so I was like, all right, well, I'm not praying. You're praying. And he folded his little hands. He said, dear Jesus, thank you for the baby that you're going to give my mommy. Amen. And was like, all right, good night, and just went to sleep. And I left the room. I'm heartbroken. I told my wife, I was like, our son's not going to follow Jesus anymore because he's going to get disappointed. Like, I'm just, I'm in a terrible place. And I tell you all of this because it, it was just one of those moments where it was so hard to, um, to believe in God and so hard to, to really be excited about what he was doing. I was angry at God, and I felt like God was just ruining our plans. And I say all of this just to kind of give you this challenge. There came a moment where I had to come to grips that God had a divine plan for us, and nothing we did was going to change it. And that was okay, that God was in charge. What mattered in our lives is that we were content with his plans, and we trusted him whether he gave us what we wanted or we didn't. Now, you guys have already had a sneak peek into the story, so you get how this thing ends. 
But literally exactly two and a half weeks after he prayed for her, then he came in one night after he had went to sleep, and he came in and he placed his hands on my wife's stomach. He said Jesus told him to pray for her. Her, the baby in her stomach, and the next day she took a test, and she was pregnant, and we gave birth to Liam there, and so he's our, our miracle, and then we had people in the church like crazy, like, can your son pray for this for me, like, and I was like, I, I know it works, so I started throwing things out, I was like, pray for daddy a truck, right, like, and this, <laughs> when we got to tell Lyric, though, we have a video of it, but when we got to tell him that he was going to be a big brother, the first words out of his mouth, the most beautiful moment I think I've ever experienced, he said, God gave me my baby. And I said, he did, buddy. And, and we just cried and cried. And I was a mess trying to look normal. And, but God was good. And I, I tell you all of that to tell you this is um, Liam now is a gift in our life. And we have this amazing story that we've been able to tell. And because of it, my wife began to share with women that are walking through infertility the hope of Jesus. And, and because of that, we've walked with women and who have walked through this, and we begin to tell our story, and we said, we're going to pray with you if you've walked through infertility or anything like that, and through that, we've, uh, we've prayed with five different women in our church at the time, and they've all given birth since to their first children, and, and uh, God has done this healing movement through this thing, and I, I look back now, and I go, I wouldn't change the story, because God not only wanted to give us what we asked for, he also had the desire for us to walk with others through theirs, and if we didn't go through our turmoil, we would have never been able to give God glory in other situations. Can I just stop there and just say this to some of you? I just really feel the Holy Spirit. Some of you are angry about your story rather than celebrating. You know what? God didn't create the rough story, but I will tell you this. He can redeem any story. And, and what we often yell at God, I wish I didn't have this in my past. What God's actually saying is now we can use this for someone else's future. Don't be angry about what you went through or what you came from. Can I tell you, be, be excited that, you know what, I wouldn't do it again, but you know what, it is who I am. So why don't I use it for the glory of God? The final thing we do is return it all back to Jesus. This is how you do it. This is what it looks like. Release control of our lives to God. Receive what he has for us, and then when we receive it, we hand it all right back to him. And we say, it's yours. This is the revelation I came to give you today. In verse 11, I read this verse, and I had those moments that I don't know if you've ever had, but I read it, and I felt like the Holy Spirit was like, no, 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 you missed that. Read that again. I was like, oh, cool, God, that's cool. And I read it again and read it again. It says this in verse 11. It says, it says and as soon as they landed, they left everything, and they followed Jesus. So I read the story, and they caught all these fish, and as soon as they landed, they followed Jesus. I was like, man, that's amazing. And I felt like the Holy Spirit was like, Tyler, read that. And I was like, yeah. Yeah, they left and followed. Yeah, great one, Jesus. And he's like, no, you missed it. Read it again. I was like, no, I kind of get it, God. Like, they left everything, and they followed him. And it was like, no, I, you're, read the verse. And I was like, I'm reading the verse. Because, like, I'm having this conversation internally with God. I'm like, I'm reading the verse. It's a, yes, great job, Jesus. You got, like, this is amazing. I love you. Awesome. And I felt like the Holy Spirit just kept nudging me. You're, you're missing what I'm saying. In this moment, all of a sudden, it, it came to me. If you read it in the KJV, it says this. It says, they forsook everything they had, and they followed Jesus. As I studied that word forsook, it meant immediate, without delay, without taking care of affairs, without preparations. As soon as their feet hit the beach, they left everything and followed Jesus. And that's when the revelation came to my heart. That it wasn't just that they left their families and their friends. It wasn't just that they left their boats or, or maybe something they had or their homes. or It wasn't the stuff. God was bringing attention to something so crucial. He was saying, listen, as soon as those boats got to the sand, they stepped out and they started walking down the beach with Jesus. And that's when the revelation hit me that God wanted me to understand in my heart. Tyler, they left their boats, they left their family, they left their friends, they left their past, they, they left everything. But even more importantly, the scholars have proven they have left their fish in the boat. They had all of these fish, yet they leave them rotting in the boat. And I'm a church planner. So all I've done for the last year of my life is fundraise so that a church can get started. And you know what my heart said? Dummies. You could have paid for the church plant. You wouldn't have had to fundraise. You wouldn't have had to rely on God. 
to supply your needs. You wouldn't have, all, everything you needed was right there, and you left it spoiling. And that's when the Holy Spirit hit my heart. Tyler, why would you be concerned with fish in a boat when the man who can summon them to the boat is walking down the beach? Why are you concerned about joy and leaving something that brings you joy when the man who instituted joy into your life is walking a separate way? Why are you concerned about those things when the one who supplies every need in your life is going a different way? And that's when in, in, in this past year, in 2021, I was fasting and praying at the beginning of the year like we always do. And that's when it hit me that God said, Tyler, that's what I want you to do. And I said, I, yes, Lord, I will do it. I'll, I'll do it until I found out what he actually meant. I was pastoring a church in Charleston, South Carolina. I had the privilege of, of pastoring a, an amazing church, but also I got the privilege of pastoring a church in my, in my hometown. I'm a first-generation believer and, and pastor, and I had the opportunity during that season to baptize my own mom. I had the opportunity to witness to some of my old friends who had never heard the gospel of Jesus. I, I had seen God do such amazing things, and we pastored a church, and God began to move in the church. We had a, just kind of a move of, of, of God's spirit, and God began to summon people. And in a, in a building smaller than this, we started adding people and people. And by the time we started doing four different services every Sunday because there wasn't enough room in the place to, for God to, uh, for all the people. And so we kept adding service time. So we, we had a service at eight and then at nine and at 10 and 11. And we, we started seeing hundreds and hundreds of people come to Jesus. It was amazing. I had a home. Finally, we had bought our first home and, and we had, everything was perfect. And, and when I read this message, God said, I said, that's amazing. They left the fish. That's crazy. And God said, it's time for you to leave the fish. And so I said, Lord, what, what are you asking? And the real simple thing was God was calling my family to sell everything we had and move to a city we had never been to because there was a need for a church. And I said, okay, what's the church name? Where's the church going to be? How, how many people are in the church so we can get it going? And that, that's exciting. He's like, no, 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 no. You're going to go into a city, and you're going to tell people about Jesus, and you're going to see if you can start a church. I was like, cool, what's the strategy? And he's like, you're going to go to the city. You're going to tell people about Jesus and see if something exists. I was like, well, this is a terrible plan, but I can help you out with it, Jesus. I'm pretty good at this. My wife, I finally gave God the, the list of what I needed him to do so that I could do what he asked me to do. And So I said, God, you got one big problem on your hands, all right? Her name is Holly. She's my wife. You're going to have to convince her. And so we're sitting at Valentine's Day dinner, and my wife does what only a discerning wife can do. She goes, hey, I'm going to leave you with a statement. We're not going to talk about it tonight. But I'm going to let you know something, and we're going to enjoy our Valentine's Day dinner, and then we'll go on about it. And I was like, well, that's quite a preface. And she goes, I know what we've been asked to do, and I'm waiting on you. And I said, well, what we're not going to do is that, like, you can say that, and we're just going to move on with the conversation. We're definitely talking about it. She's like, we're not talking about it. I want to have a good Valentine's Day dinner. And I said, well, I probably wouldn't have introduced it at that moment then, like, and she's like, well, we can talk after Valentine's Day. And so the whole dinner, I was just sitting there. She's like, so how was your week? And I was like, well, now it's ruined. <laughs> I couldn't focus. But God had spoken to her heart and prepared her heart. And so the next big challenge for us was Lyric. Because Lyric had family and friends and his school and everything. And if you know anything about moving a kid, it's heartbreaking for them. Especially three hours away from his family and his friends and his new school and his teachers. And so we began to pray. And my wife, every single night, I can't make this up every single night I would watch my wife weep as she prayed God you do something in lyrics life so that we don't ruin his life and so it was Mother's Day and we uh every single Mother's Day I take the boys and um I slip them my debit card lyric holds on to it and we take mom out to dinner and she gets to pick where we go and we get a spot and and then lyric covers the tab he hands it to him and teach him how to fill out a receipt and he hugs his mom and is real sweet to her and I try to always talk him into giving her a foot rub but he won't do it and um but we had this moment and so after the dinner we I was like we were talking about how great the steak was and uh we're leaving and my son in the back goes oh my goodness dad I forgot to tell you and I was like well hold up we're talking you're not going to interrupt us and I gave him the whole talk about you don't interrupt your mom and dad when they're speaking and things like that he's like but I have to tell you I was like okay and so uh, I said, son, what is it? Tell us really quick. And he goes, dad, it was crazy. Last night I woke up. 
I was like, well, that is phenomenal, son. Did you go to the bathroom? That is, that is so cool. Good job. You didn't wet the bed. That is cool. That is awesome. It's like, no. Cannot kid you. We are not this spiritual. We're not this great. This is just Lyric. But Lyric said, Dad, last night I woke up and Jesus was on the end of my bed. I was like, okay, that's a turn of the conversation. And in his six-year-old mind, he begins to explain that he woke up and Jesus was speaking, it was on his bed, and so he sat next to Jesus, and Jesus spoke to my son. We had never told him anything about what was coming up with Spartanburg or anything. Cannot fake this. He says, Dad, we're moving to the mountains to tell people about Jesus. And chills went through my body. I don't know what was wrong with my wife, because she's like, oh, cool, all right. So, uh, and I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, this is a moment. And uh, long story short, through his little six-year-old mind, he begins to tell us that he has a conversation with Jesus that he tells Jesus, I'm scared to leave my family, my friends, my school, all these things. And Jesus says, hey, Lyric, it's going to be okay. And so he says, it's going to be fine. So we ask him, what do you think about it? He says, it's okay. Jesus said it was going to be okay. So we move on, and if the band wants to come, we'll close here. But we move on, and a couple weeks later, we can't tell Lyric it's actually true because he would tell everyone, and the secret would be out. The church would hate us, and everything would be over. And so we, we had to sweep it in. So the Saturday night before the Sunday that we're going to be announcing to our church we're leaving and selling everything, uh, we, tell, we set Lyric down. And I'm thinking it's going to be this deep emotional moment, right? I'm like, Lyric, buddy, I got something to tell you. God has asked us to move to the mountains in Spartanburg to... Uh, to start a new church and tell people who don't know Jesus about Jesus. And Lyric looks at me, and he has, like, this confused look on his face. He's like, I know. I told you that. <laughs> I was like, well, yeah, okay. And I said, well, what are your thoughts about it? And he said, Dad, it's going to be okay. And I said, why do you feel? I'm trying to get deeper. And I can't make this up, guys. After this word has been in my heart for a year, and after the moment that I've shared with you, I'm worried about Lyric. And, and this is what he says. I said, son, what? How do you know it's going to be okay? And he goes, Dad, because Jesus said so. If you say so, then that's it has to go that way. And right there we knew God had something on our life, and so we did exactly that. We sold everything, minus the kids. We packed up what little we had left into a small U-Haul, and we moved to Spartanburg. We had never been to the city before we moved there. And we moved there, and we began to just do exactly what Jesus said to do. We didn't create a, we, didn't, we don't have a building. We don't have amazing musicians that sing and great things come out while I'm down here cracking and stuff like that. We don't have anything. We just started going to coffee shops and restaurants and parks and telling people about the person of Jesus. And now today we'll be having, hosting an event where we just started renting out uh, venues and paying for the food and telling people from the community, come on in. We want to tell you about Jesus. And God's beginning to grow this and the last meeting we had, we had over 60 people in our uh, in this art gallery that we took over, uh, drinking coffee and hearing about Jesus. And we've had over 30 people sign up. We've had a, our first salvation, a woman who said, uh, I'm a sixth generation addict, and it ends with me today. And she gave her life to Jesus, and we've been walking with her through through that. And I, I know I've, I've told a lot of stories today. And I, I love to preach verse by verse and things, but I really felt like God has challenged me in this season just to, to tell more. He says we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. And I came here to share testimony of this, of God has been so good to me despite my inadequacies. But I have only found his goodness is on the opposite side of my sacrifice. I, I, I feel led to share with you guys that I wasn't raised in church. I come from generational addiction. I have family members on death row right now. I have family members who have died because of violence, because of drugs and alcohol. I, I'm, I come from just a, a generational thing. And God is like the Lord in his kindness, reached down from heaven and picked me out of that and has changed my story. I was headed down that path and God pulled me out. And I'll never forget, and maybe some of you can identify with this, I'll never forget hearing that despite all the bad decisions and bad things I've done in my life, that there was a God that would receive me and restore me completely without any question of anything else from me. It blew my mind. And that day when I gave my heart to the Lord, 
when I said yes to Jesus, I remember saying this. I said these words. I would do anything he ever asked of me if this is true. And so I became a pastor when I didn't want a pastor because I felt ill-qualified. We moved to Spartanburg and we sold everything. And we were coming back to this pinnacle moment that I kind of wanted to call you to. In John chapter 15, on the same beach, in the same situation, Christ has been crucified on the cross. Peter, Simon Peter, has denied him three times. The disciples have scattered all around out of fear for their lives. Some are hiding behind a trap door and others are nowhere to be seen. And Jesus finds Simon Peter back on a beach. And many Christians know this story, but he comes to him and he, they go fishing and they catch fish and the boat is filled again and they pull it up and Jesus is sitting by a campfire on the same beach that he called him the first time. And he looks at Peter and he says, Peter, do you love me? Peter says, of course, you know I do. Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Three times to restore the denials. He restores them back to his former position. But I read that my whole life. I've heard it preached that way. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And then as I begin to read, the scriptures actually say something different. The first time he asks, he doesn't ask Peter, do do you love me? As you get this heading, he's sitting at a campfire. The boat is filled with fish again. And the proper words that come out of Jesus' mouth is this. Peter, do you still love me more than these? And I can imagine he's looking at the boat filled with fish. And he says, years ago, I was worthy to walk away from boats filled with fish for. Now things have changed. Life isn't as easy. Am I still worthy of the fish? Am I still worthy of the stuff? And I feel like the Holy Spirit has brought me here today to ask some of you who've been following Jesus for a long time, that one time you ran to him and said, get me out of this. I need help. And he saved you and he changed your life. And then we get comfortable and we start telling God how to be God. And he's saying, hey, am I still worthy of this stuff? Am I still good enough to follow? Am I I still worth it all? Some of you, you've walked through it over and over again. Maybe you've had an addiction and you've walked through it and you got clean and then you found yourself back in the addiction and he welcomed you back again and now you're back on that same road again. I'm here to tell you, God is summoning you back to himself and saying, hey, do you remember the moment when I received you freely? Come back again. Am I still worthy of it? And I came here to challenge your hearts with one simple message today. I don't get this right all the time, but my wife and I had a moment where we had to choose. Was our comfort at our current church that with a job, we had a salary, we had all that. Was that worth more than Jesus? And we had to choose, will we move? So we moved our family, and it's come with hard days. It's come with rejection. It's come with difficulty. We have the promise of nothing on the other side, but the presence of God has gone with us. And I think God is calling some of you to a lot of things, and a lot of times we will choose comfort, or we'll tell God, God, let me finish this up, or let me get the savings account here, or let me me just get a little more clean, or let me do this, or let me go through this program, or let, let, let me do this thing to set up my career, and all of these things. And what God is saying is, hey, am I worthy to follow? Do you trust me? And I came here to challenge your heart today. Do you trust him? Truly trust that God is good and able in your situation. Would you stand to your feet right now? I want to close with a moment of response. A moment to respond in your life to say, Jesus, you're still worth it. To decide that today he's still enough. To decide that today God is still worthy of following. To decide again in your heart today that God is still worthy of everything you have and everything. Who cares about stuff when God's walking the other way? Come on, right now, all over this place, would you close your eyes? And if you're in this place and there's something you're holding on to more than God, it could be a situation, it could be comfort, it could be a job, it could be a calling, whatever it is, but if there's something in here that you're like, man, I need to surrender this back to God. I've gotten too comfortable with this. My faith has gotten too comfortable. If that's you, would you just lift both hands in the air as a sign of surrender and say, Lord, I surrender it to you right now. 
Right now, in your own words, just begin to say, it's yours, God. You're worthy of everything I have. You're worthy of everything I've walked through. You're worthy of everything that I've I've gripped hold of. God, I release again and say, God, I just want Jesus in my life. Father, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, the name that is above every other name, the name that, that is the only name that breaks strongholds, that breaks generational curses, that breaks our flesh in half, that we might become the goodness of God. Father, I pray right now in that name that you would speak to the hearts of these people. God, that you would speak to their hearts in a way that only they could say, only God could change my story. Only God could have done this. Only God is worthy to step away. Only God is worthy to keep on going. Only God is worthy to forgive and not need vengeance. Only Jesus. God, in these next few moments as we respond to you, I pray that your presence would be tangible. Holy Spirit, we yield ourselves to you now. In Jesus' name, amen.